Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now that I've got your attention, um, let's have a bit of fun with this stuff now, and I'm trying to get you kind of like a bit more warmed up, much more wanting to share things. And I always found the secret to all of this is chocolate. And the favourite store in Adelaide, whenever you're in Adelaide, has to be Haig's, and some amazing dark chocolates here. Now, would anyone like this? Anyone want chocolate? Okay, well... The one memory I've got of my final year in high school is we had a teacher who was much better suited to being a prison warder in a Nazi concentration camp than being a school teacher. And he had this amazing kind of like way of waking us up, he reckons, every afternoon. And that was every afternoon he'd give us a test or an exam to start the afternoon with. So I'm going to do the same. We're going to have a bit of a test and I've got packets of Hague chocolates here for whoever can get it. So this is the first question, and you can only answer if you've never seen it before, okay? If you've ever been in a workshop with me and you've used it, please do not kind of like call out the answer, because you'll be cheating. But the answer to this, what do those seven words have in common? And it is worth some Hague chocolate. What do those seven words have in common? Double letters, yeah, but not worth Hague chocolate. Important, something much more special about those seven words. What's unique about them? What do they have in common? It's about getting our brains moving now. What do we have in common? They're all different. Definitely not worth Hague hey, chocolate. Yep. <laughs> yep, dead right. Take the first letter, put it to the end, writes the word. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Okay, the second one, just to get you still moving, is this. You're driving a car at a constant speed. On your left is a valley. On the right is a fire engine travelling at the same speed as you. In front of you is a galloping pig, which is the same size as your car and you can't overtake it. Behind you is a helicopter flying at ground level. Both the giant pig and the helicopter are also travelling at the same speed as you. What must you do to safely get out of this highly dangerous situation? Wake up. Wake up. Yep, no. Come on, this is worth another kind of like uh, Hague chocolates. Now, give, I'll, let you, I'll give you a clue. Every single one of you has been in that situation. This is not dreaming. This is real. What's the answer? Keep the same you can't help but keep the same speed. They're all travelling at the same thing, but it's dangerous. The pig is the same size as the car. There's a fire engine. There's a helicopter. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, yeah, no. Come on, where are you? Every single one of you has been in this situation. Think outside the box. Get rid of the box. This is about getting rid of the box. Where are you? Fine. Change it, you can't. Come on, where are you? Drop out of the car, that would be highly dangerous. Get run over by a pig that's the same size as your car. Come on, where are you? We've got to get outside the box. Sorry? Sorry? Dead right. Never ride a children's merry-go-round when you're drunk. Get off and you will be safe. Well done. Now, the final one, we don't have chocolates, but, and I don't want you to yell out the answer, but you've only got 15 seconds to work out the answer. Keep it to yourself. And the question is simply this. How many Fs are there in finished to experts? How many Fs can you count? How many Fs? Keep it to yourself. You've got 15 seconds. 10 seconds. 8. 6. 4. Two, one. Okay. You've only got one choice. Can you put up your hand? How many people think there's one F there? We've got, well, we've got three, four people. How many people think there are two Fs? No one? How many people think there are three Fs? We've got one, two, more. How many people think there are four Fs? Got another person. How many people think there are five Fs? We've got another five people. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. By far, how many people think there are six Fs? A lot more. How many people think there are seven Fs? And how many people think there are eight Fs? Eight. 
You know how many ifs there are? Seven. Those of you who only got two and three and one, well, don't worry, you're the big picture people in the audience. You missed all the odds. Those who got seven, you obviously have an eye for detail. Interesting how we can look at the same thing and we can see things different. And you know what? I love that because to me, strength lies in our differences, not in our similarities. What's lovely about community is every person in it is unique and special. And together, we can like make up this thing called community. It's really an interesting exercise where we can look at the same thing but see things kind of like different in terms of there were seven. Okay, now what I want to do, share with you, hang on, hang on. And we've got our a technician here. Wait a minute. Hang on. I wonder if someone could grab the technician. We need volume. Yeah. What I want to share with you is the story of one woman who I consider by far the best community builder I have ever met. Her name is Pam Warhurst. And what I want to share with you is her story in her village. Her village is a place called Top Warden. It's an English village. And what I'm asking you to look at is not what she is on about and what she's trying to get people excited about, but how did she go about it? What can we learn from her as a facilitator? And so if we can go back and get some volume. Okay. Uh, hang on. We lost it. Okay, what can we learn from her in facilitating community development? The will to live life differently can start in some of the most unusual places. This is where I come from, Todmorden. It's a market town in the north of England, 15,000 people between Leeds and Manchester, fairly normal market town used to look like this, and now it's more like this. With fruit and veg and herbs sprouting up all over the place. We call it propaganda gardening. <laughs> Corner of our railway station car park, front of our health centre, people's front gardens, and even in front of the police station. <laughs> We've got edible canal topaz, and we've got sprouting cemeteries. The soil is extremely good. <laughs> we've even invented a new form of tourism. It's called vegetable tourism. And believe it or not, people come from all over the world to poke around in our raised beds, even when there's not much growing. But it starts a conversation. And you know, we're not doing it because we're bored. <laughs> we're doing it because we want to start a revolution. We try to answer this simple question, can you find a unifying language that cuts across age and income and culture that will help people themselves find a new way of living? See spaces around them differently, think about the resource they use differently, interact differently. Can we find that language? And then can we replicate those actions? And the answer would appear to be yes and the language would appear to be food. So three and a half years ago, a few of us sat around the kitchen table and we just invented the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> we came up with a really simple game plan that we put to a public meeting. We did not consult, we did not write a report, enough of all that. <laughs> and we said to that public meeting in Todmorden, look, let's imagine that our town is focused around three plates. A community plate, the way we live our everyday lives. A learning plate, what we, learn, what we teach our kids in school and what, we, what new skills we share amongst ourselves. And business, what, what we do with the pound in our pocket and which businesses we choose to support. Now, let's imagine those plates agitated with community actions around food. If we start one of those community plates spinning, that's really great. That really starts to empower people. But if we can then spin that community plate with the learning plate and then spin it with the business plate, we've got a real show there. We've got some action theatre. We're starting to build resilience ourselves. We're starting to reinvent community ourselves. And we've done it all without a flipping strategy document. <laughs> Thank you.
And here's the thing as well. We've not asked anybody's permission to do this. We're just doing it. <laughs> and we are certainly not waiting for that check to drop through the letterbox before we start. And most importantly of all, we are not daunted by the sophisticated arguments that say these small actions are meaningless in the face of tomorrow's problems because I have seen the power of small actions and it is awesome. So, back to the public meeting. <laughs> we put that proposition to the meeting, two seconds, and then the room exploded. I have never, ever experienced anything like that in my life. And it's been the same in every single room, in every town that we've ever told our story. People are ready and respond to the story of food. They want positive actions they can engage in, and in their bones, they know it's time to take personal responsibility and invest in more kindness to each other and to the environment. And since we had that meeting three and a half years ago, it's been a heck of a roller coaster. We started with a seed swap, really simple stuff, and then we took an area of land, a strip on the side of our main road, which was a dog toilet, basically, and we turned it into a really lovely herb garden. We took the corner of the car park in the station that you saw, and we made vegetable beds for everybody to share and pick from themselves. We went to the doctors. We've just had a £6 million health centre built in Todmorden, and for some reason that I cannot comprehend, it has been surrounded by prickly plants. <laughs> so... We went to the doctor, said, would you mind us taking them up? They said, absolutely fine, provided you get planning permission and you do it in Latin and you do it in triplicate. So we did. <laughs> and now there are fruit trees and bushes and herbs and vegetables around that doctor's surgery. And there's been lots of other examples like the corn that was in front of the police station and the old people's home that we've planted up with food that they can pick and grow. But it isn't just about growing because we all are part of this jigsaw. It's about taking those artistic people in your community and doing some fabulous designs in those raised beds to explain to people what's growing there. Because there's so many people that don't really recognise a vegetable unless it's in a bit of plastic with a bit of an instruction packet on the top. <laughs> so, we have some people who design these things. If it looks like this, please don't pick it. But if it looks like this, help yourself. This is about sharing and investing in kindness. And for those people that don't want to do either of those things, maybe they can cook. So we pick them seasonally and then we go on the street or in the pub, or in the church, or wherever people are living their lives. This is about us going to the people and saying, we are all part of the local food jigsaw, we are all part of a solution. And then because we know we've got vegetable tourists and we love them to bits and they're absolutely fantastic, we thought, what can we do to give them an even better experience? So we invented, without asking of course, the incredible edible green route. And this is a route of exhibition gardens and edible towpaths and Bee friendly sites and the story of pollinators. And it's a route that we designed that takes people through the whole of our town, past our cafes and our small shops, through our market, not just to and fro from the supermarket. And we're hoping that in changing people's footfall around our town, we're also changing their behaviour. And then there's the second plate, the learning plate. Well, we're in partnership with the high school. We've created a company. We are designing and building an aquaponics unit in some land that we spare at the back of the high school, like you do. And now we're going to be growing fish and vegetables in an orchard with bees. And the kids are helping us build that. And the kids are on the board. And because the community was really keen on working with the high school, the high school is now teaching agriculture. And because it's teaching agriculture, we started to think, how can we then get those kids that, are, that, that never had a qualification before in their lives but are really excited about growing, how can we give them some more experience? So we got some land that was donated by a local garden centre. It was really quite muddy, but in a truly incredible way, totally voluntary-led, we have put, turned that into a market garden training centre. And that is polytunnels and raised beds and all the things you need to get the soil under your fingers and think maybe there's a job in this for me in the future. And because we were doing that, some local academics said, you know, we could help design a commercial horticulture course for you. There's not one that we know of. So they're doing that, and we're going to launch it later this year. And it's all an experiment, and it's all voluntary. And then there's the third plate. Because if you walk through an edible landscape, and if you're learning new skills, and if you start to get interested in what's growing seasonally, you might just want to spend more of your own money in support of local producers. Not just veg, but meat and cheese and beer and whatever else it might be. But then we're just a community group, you know, we're just all volunteers, what could we actually do? So we did some really simple things. We fundraised, we got some blackboards, we put Incredible Edible on the top, we gave it to every market trader that was selling locally, and they scribbled on. 
what they were selling in any one, one week. Really popular, people congregated around it, sales were up. And then we had a chat with the farmers and we said we're really serious about this, but they didn't actually believe us. So we thought, OK, uh, what should we do? I know, if we can create a campaign around, around one product and show them there is local loyalty to that product, maybe they'll change their mind and see we're serious. So we launched a campaign, because it just amuses me, called Every Egg Matters. And <laughs> what we did <laughs> was we put people on our egg map. It's a stylized map of Todmorden. Uh, anybody that's selling their excess eggs at the garden gate, perfectly legally, to their neighbours, we've stuck on there. We started with four and we've now got 64 on. And the result of that was that people were then going into shops asking for a local tub and an egg. And the result of that was some farmers upped the amount of flocks they got of free rent birds, and then they went on to meat birds. And although these are really, really small steps, that, that increasing local economic confidence is starting to play out in a number of ways. And we now have farmers doing cheese, and they've upped their flocks of rare breed pigs. They're doing pasties and pies and things that they would have never have done before. We've got increasing market stalls selling local food, and in a survey that local students did for us, 49% of all food traders in that town said that their bottom line had increased because of what we were actually doing. And we're just volunteers, and it's only an experiment. <laughs> now, none of this is rocket science. It certainly is not clever, and it's not original. But it is joined up, and it is inclusive. This is not a movement for those people who are going to sort themselves out anyway. This is a movement for everyone. We have a motto, if you eat, you're in. <laughs> across age, across income, across culture. <laughs> it's been really quite a roller coaster experience. But going back to that first question that we asked, is it replicable? Yeah. It most certainly is replicable. More than 30 towns in England now are spinning the incredible edible plates. Whichever way they want to do it, they're of their own volition, they're trying to make their own lives differently. And worldwide, we've got communities across America and Japan. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, what can you say? America and Japan and New Zealand. People, after the earthquake in New Zealand, visited us in order to incorporate some of this public spiritedness around local growing into the heart of Christchurch. And none of this takes more money, and none of this demands a bureaucracy. But it does demand that you think things differently, and you are prepared to bend budgets and work programmes in order to create that supportive framework that compute communities can bounce off. And there's some great ideas already in our patch. Our local authority has decided to make everywhere uh, incredible edible, and in support of that, have decided to do two things. First, they're going to create an asset register of spare land that they've got, put it in a food bank so that communities can use that wherever they live, and they're going to underpin that with a license. And then they said to every single one of their workforce, if you can, help those communities grow and help them maintain their spaces. Suddenly, we're seeing actions on the ground from local government. We're seeing this mainstreamed. We are responding creatively at last to what Rio demanded of us. And there's lots more you could do. I mean, just to list a few. One, please stop putting prickly plants around public buildings. It's a waste of space. <laughs> Secondly, please create please, please create edible landscapes so that our children start to walk past their food day in, day out, on our high streets, in our parks, wherever that might be. Inspire local planners to put the food sites at the heart of the town and the city plan, not relegate them to the edges of the settlements that nobody can see. Encourage all our schools to take this seriously. This isn't a second-class exercise. If we want to inspire the farmers of tomorrow, then please let us say to every school, Create a sense of purpose around the importance of the environment, local food, and soils. Put that at the heart of your school culture, and you will create a different generation. There are so many things you can do, but ultimately, this is about something really simple. Through an organic process, through an increasing recognition of the power of small actions, we are starting at last to believe in ourselves again and to believe in our capacity, each and every one of us, to build a different and a kinder future. And in my book, that's incredible. Thank you. What can we learn from her as a facilitator of kind of like change? I visited this place about eight months ago and everything she talks about is real. 
town's gone through this amazing transformation. So many people caught up in it. What is it we can learn from it? Sorry? Just do it. Yeah, I think that's dead right. I, I just think she's just this can do type person. Has that passion. And can I say the stuff called community building? You know, the Chinese have a lovely expression for people in retail. A man without a smiling face must not open a shop. Well, when it comes to community building, my motto is if you've had a charisma bypass at some stage in your life, don't go into community building. You need to have passion. You've got to get people excited. You've got to move people at the gut, not just at the head. So passion is absolutely an essential element of all of this stuff. If you haven't got passion, you're really stuffed. You really are. What else? What else can we learn from her? What was a favourite statement that always kept coming through? Experiment. Experiment, yep. Give it a go. Take the leap and develop your wings on the way down. You know, I think we just, sometimes just got to give a go. There's no right or wrong way. Just give it a go. Anything else? Yep. All done by volunteers. But what was that phrase she kept using? Anyone remember? Yeah, the whole power of small actions. And I think, again, we've got to believe in that. Sometimes we just feel we've got to have these big bang stuff all the time, but the combination of putting some of those things together, I think, kind of like makes a fair bit. And that whole thing about passion, I think, is really important. And humour, she certainly has a sense of humour. I love that thing. If you eat, you're in. You know, you can't but smile at those kind of like comments and whatever. So there's some really interesting stuff. Again, have a look at it. That's the 203rd time I've seen that YouTube. Every time I see it, I get something new out of it. She is amazing. And again, I think we've got, just got to look at some of these things and say, what is it we can learn from that? Where can we go? Now, some of you haven't said a lot this morning, so we're going to change all of that. Would everyone like to stand? Everyone stand. And I want you to peruse the audience. What an amazing combination of people. And what I want you now to do is identify the person in the room that you least know. Who is the person in the room you least know? And by putting one foot in front of the other, would you like to just move towards that person, team up, and start a conversation? Put one foot in front of another. Anyone without a partner? There, we are two here. Just sorry, is a girl in, in uh, pink there? Just over here. Just two. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. You don't know what to talk about. I always find it absolutely amazing. As soon as someone actually opens doors and windows for people to connect, particularly people they've never even met before, it's so simple. And so a lot of our role, I think, is just about opening doors and windows to get people doing what they can do normally. But often people just somehow need other people to kind of like give them permission sometimes to do it. And so one of the things is I'm really keen on getting people connected. And what I really want you to do now is to get to know that other person. And you know, I spend most of my life on a farm and I love rural humour. Good morning, I'm Alex Lyon, I'm the Seconda Special Projects Liaison Officer in the Regional Coordination Statistics Unit of the Rural Re Department of Agriculture. Yep, and I'm Bill. I want you to discover the Bill and Joan that you are talking with. And so over the next seven minutes, I'm just going to ask you to have a conversation with that person, but I'm going to give you the topics I want you to talk about. And so the very first thing I want you to talk about is... Um, What's the best thing that's happened to you already today? For a few of us to wake up with such a relief, but uh, besides that, what else? What's the best thing that's happened to you? Might have been with your kids, might have been over at breakfast, someone you met on the way, but what's the best thing that's happened to you already today? You've got 47 seconds each to share that, okay? 47 seconds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Many of you are really now starting to get to know that person. You know, just the vigour of the conversation is fantastic to hear from about 98% of you. It's unbelievable. Most of you have discovered a lot, but just in case there's something you haven't yet discovered about the other person, the new topic is this. Can you share with this person your life story? And you've only got 58 seconds. So if you've only got less than a minute to share your life story, what would you include that's important to you? I'll tell you when to swap over. You've got 58 seconds. What's important in your life that you would include in only 58 seconds, which is less than one minute? Go for it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now that I've got your attention, Every single person in our communities is incredibly gifted. And I love to describe um, gifts in three ways. Every one of us knows something about something. Um, we call those the gifts of the head. They're knowledge gifts. We've read books, we've done courses, we have hobbies. Every one of us is, actually knows something about something in a little bit more detail. Then we have gifts of the hands. Some of you in the room here can actually facilitate a meeting. Some of you can coach a soccer team. Some of you can bake a cake. Some of you can knit a scarf. Some of you can solve a puzzle. They're called gifts of the hands. Some of you can put a social media campaign together. And finally, every one of us have gifts of the heart. They're the things we deeply care about and we're often keen to work on. I, for example, are passionate about the Frio Docker Footy Club. I, at the present time, would be more than happy to be part of a revolution to get rid of Ross Lyons, the coach. He is hopeless. And until we get rid of him, we're going nowhere. I'd be always willing. But I also care about young people and their contribution. I care about the environment. I deeply care about Indigenous people and their kind of like uniqueness in our country. And if people ask me to get involved around things there, I would always get involved because I care about it. So if I asked you, what's the one gift you bring to your community, whether it be your football club, your swimming club, your geographic community or your church or whatever, whatever community you want to be, what one gift from those three categories would you say is your number one gift? It may be a gift of the head or it may be a gift of the hands or it may be a gift of the heart. What one would you choose? And you've got 45 seconds. Gift of the head, hands or heart? to your community. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, can I now ask you, as, as a group of two, can you now form with two other groups to create a group of six and use the most important dynamic in having a good conversation, and that is to form into a circle. Not a line, but a circle. Circle is the basic way to have a good conversation. So form a circle of six. Can we form a circle of six? <laughs> Is there anyone not in a circle yet? Circle of six. Yeah, you can make it a group of eight. Um, yeah. Make it a group of eight if you like. Okay. Everyone in. Okay, now, I, wanna, I want you to identify now the person who's got the funkiest pair of socks in the group. There's something creative about them. Can you just work out who's got the most interesting pair of socks? Okay. Okay. Now, now that we've worked out who is the... Uh, the person is a little bit left to centre and whatever. Starting with them and going anti-clockwise around the circle, I wonder whether you now can introduce your new friend to the other four in the group. And you've got less than a minute from everything they've shared with you. But the one thing I want you to make sure you include in your 57 in second introduction is what we call in youth work a warm fuzzy. What's something special that you've learned about that person? It might be something they do, it might be an attitude they've got, a behaviour, but wow, that's pretty special. And I want you to make sure you include that. It's called that 
acknowledgement of admiration, something that you've really picked up that you really liked about your new friend. And you've each got 57 seconds, less than one minute, going, starting with a person with the funkiest pair of socks and going anti-clockwise. Okay, I think every group's now finished. Can I get you now? Can you, um, my grandmother was only four foot 11. She always used to say good things come in small packets. So can you work out who's the shortest in your group? Who is the shortest? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we've worked that out. Starting with that person and going clockwise, I want us to do one final exercise. And that is I want you now to share with your group something you're proud of that no one in that group will know about. Now, maybe something you'd done in a previous life. You might have been your primary school's under, kind of like seven, long distance jumper, and you've never forgotten that. You were the best in long jumping. Or it may be a closet hobby that you may be a community developer by day, but boy, what you love is to get back in the kitchen and you're the greatest French chef the world has ever seen. Or it may be something you aspire to do, that by age 60 you want to walk to the base camp of Everest. So whether it's something you've achieved that you're proud of, a closet hobby, or something that you kind of like dream of doing in the future, what is the one thing you're really proud of about your life? Now, I've had a couple of amusing episodes of this recently. I was in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago in a little town called Winton. Now, this would have to be the most right-wing fascist. Everyone there would have voted for Pauline Hanson and Donald Trump, definitely. Really conservative. We had 37 people around the room, all talking about the future of the town, and we asked them to do that exercise. And the fifth person was a six-foot-five sheep farmer. And he said, well, what the heck, I just love cross-dressing. Well, you can imagine in a, a place like Winton, the whole roof rattled, you know. But after that, amazing. People were willing to share anything because someone had done it. And then uh, I'm working with the Halls Creek uh, Shire up in the Kimberleys. It's uh, the largest, um, the highest uh, Aboriginal um, populated shire we have in the state. And we're working with the remote leaders there. And there was um, about 12 of them doing this leadership program. And we did that exercise. And a guy from out of Belgo, everyone shared amazing stuff. And we got to him. And I thought, boy, he's missed it totally. He started by saying, well, I need to say I've had a really shit life, he said. I fell madly in love with this woman in the community and I went off to the army to build up a nest egg. And what do I find? She's running around with every other guy in the community. I became suicidal. I stuck a gun in my mouth and it just went like this. And I thought, no, you know, he's just missed the whole point. And then he reached a point and said, and then I wrote a song about it. And I won the Kimberley Song Competition! <laughs> and uh, he leaped onto the table and started singing the song. Now, I'm not asking you to do that, but what's, what are you proud of? Starting with the person who is the shorty in the group and going clockwise. And you've only got 27 seconds. Oh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've just been involved in an exercise for about 23 minutes and so on. Is there anyone who, who can genuinely say they didn't enjoy that? Anyone found that a waste of time? Be honest, anyone? How many people did find that really an interesting and valuable kind of experience? Can I ask why? Hmm? Yeah. Isn't it nice to get into a little bit deeper than we normally? You know, I think in some communities, if we didn't have the weather, we'd be in a lot of trouble and, and so on. But um, it's just so good to kind of like have that. Anyone else want to express how they felt? Yeah. Everyone has a story. I love that. Uh, anyone else want to? Yep. Yep. Can't judge. Yep. Anyone else want to share anything? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. How small our world is. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, fantastic. Um, I love doing that with community, and often when I do it, all you hear around the room, particularly that last exercise, I didn't know you'd done that. I didn't know that. You know, even within our clubs and our organisations, we don't get down to it. That's why I love sharing the story of a, a Denver's story about him and his 65 cricket clubs, just asking him that stuff. Recently, I was in a little uh, wheat belt town that's collapsing, and there's a little Catholic school, and um, it's losing numbers on the verge of collapse. And we brought together a whole pile of uh, parents one morning for what we call a Waffle Wednesday, where we just put on waffles and pancakes and just talk about the school and its future. Many of the mums who turned up, and they're all mums, there about nine of them, they were um, all concerned that were they doing the right thing by keeping the kids at the school? There were no extracurricular activities. The, the three teachers in the school didn't live in the community. They lived in a nearby regional town. There was no after-school clubs. And these were things that were weighing heavy on on the mums thinking, you know, maybe it's best we close and our kids can go to the state school or we'll board the kids out or whatever. But we did that exercise and it was interesting, the first one said, well, I'm just really proud that I was West Australia's under 14, under 16 and under 18 archery champion back in the 1990s. The second one said, well, I'm really proud, I've just won West Australia's best country garden. Third one said, well, you can tell from my accent, I'm not from around here. I met a young Aussie farmer in London, married him. But before then, um, I was the concert pianist in the Toronto Philharmonic Orchestra for six years. And so we went around the room. We got to the last one and she said, before I share what I want about, why are we expecting teachers to organise after school and lunch clubs? Look how incredibly rich we are. And there and there, they set up three after school clubs just by doing that one little activity. And all of them had no idea of what each of them had to offer. And I think that's part of the world we're in. We just don't seem to know people. And it's really nice to get into that. I think the other thing is it's just nice to have an in-depth conversation. I wonder how many of you forgot to actually ask the other person's name, for example, when you had to introduce them. Um, hang on, what's their name type thing, you know. But um, one of the things that uh, I was raised by my grand that four foot 11 grandmother who insisted that I had to learn one new thing every day. So it meant before I went to sleep most nights, I had to go to an encyclopedia and try to dig up one interesting fact. For me, yesterday, one of the great learnings was having a conversation. Is Ashley here? Ashley Ross in the group? But it was an amazing conversation with Ashley. I just learned so much from him. One of the things he introduced me to was this wonderful little 10 minute kind of like uh, TED talk. And it's all about conversation competency. And I think it flows on well from what we've just done. So let's have a look at this one. see a show of hands. How many of you have unfriended someone on Facebook because they said something offensive about politics or religion, childcare, food? <laughs> and how many of you know at least one person that you avoid because you just don't want to talk to them? <laughs> you know, it used to be that in order to have a polite conversation, we just had to follow the advice of Henry Higgins and My Fair Lady, stick to the weather and your health. But <laughs> These days, with climate change and anti-vaxxing, those subjects <laughs> are not safe either. So this world that we live in, this world in which every conversation has the potential to devolve into an argument where our politicians can't speak to one another, and where even the most trivial of issues have someone fighting both passionately for it and against it, it's not normal. Pew Research did a study of 10,000 American adults, and they found that at this moment, we are more polarized, we are more divided than we ever have been in history. We're less likely to compromise, which means we're not listening to each other, and we make decisions about where to live, who to marry, and even who our friends are gonna be based on what we already believe. Again, that means we're not listening to each other. A conversation requires a balance between talking and listening, and somewhere along the way, we lost that balance. Now, part of that is due to technology, the smartphones that you all either have in your hands or close enough that you could grab them really quickly. According to Pew Research, about a third of American teenagers send more than 100 texts a day. And many of them, almost most of them, are more likely to text their friends than they are to talk to them face to face. 
There's this great piece in The Atlantic, it was written by a high school teacher named Paul Barnwell, and he gave his kids a communication project. He wanted to teach them how to speak on a specific subject without using notes, and he said this. I came to realize... <laughs> I came to realize that conversational competence might be the single most overlooked skill we fail to teach. Kids spend hours each day engaging with ideas and each other through screens, but rarely do they have an opportunity to hone their interpersonal communication skills. It might sound like a funny question, but we have to ask ourselves, is there any 21st century skill more important than being able to sustain, sustain coherent, confident conversation? Now, I make my living talking to people. Nobel Prize winners, truck drivers, billionaires, kindergarten teachers, heads of state, plumbers. I talk to people that I like. I talk to people that I don't like. I talk to some people that I disagree with deeply on a personal level, but I still have a great conversation with them. So I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes or so teaching you how to talk and how to listen. Many of you have already heard a lot of advice on this, things like look the person in the eye, think of interesting things, topics to discuss in advance, look, uh, nod and smile to show that you're paying attention. <laughs> Uh, repeat back what you just heard or summarize it. So I want you to forget all of that. It is crap. <laughs> there is no reason to learn how to show you're paying attention if you are, in fact, <laughs> paying attention. <laughs> now, I actually use the exact same skills as a professional interviewer that I do in regular life. Um, so, I'm going to teach you how to interview people, and that's actually going to help you learn how to be better conversationalists. Learn to have a conversation without wasting your time, without getting bored, and please God, without offending anybody. We've all had really great conversations. We've had them before. We know what it's like. The kind of conversation where you walk away feeling engaged and inspired, or where you feel like you've made a real connection, or you've been perfectly understood. There is no reason why most of your interactions can't be like that. So I have 10 basic rules. I'm going to walk you through all of them. But honestly, if you just choose one of them and master it, you're already going to enjoy better conversations. Number one, don't multitask. And I don't mean just set down your cell phone or your tablet or your car keys or whatever's in your hand. I mean, be present. Be in that moment. Don't be thinking about your argument you have with your boss, don't be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. If you want to get out of the conversation, get out of the conversation. But don't be half in it and half out of it. Number two, don't pontificate. If you want to state your opinion without any opportunity for response or argument or pushback or growth, write a blog. <laughs> Now, there's a really good reason why I don't allow pundits on my show, because they're really boring. If they're a conservative, they're going to hate Obama and food stamps and abortion. If they're a liberal, they're going to hate big banks and oil corporations and Dick Cheney. <coughs> totally predictable. And you don't want to be like that. You need to enter every conversation assuming that you have something to learn. The famed therapist Eb Scott Peck said that true listening requires a setting aside of oneself. And sometimes that means setting aside your personal opinion. He said that sensing this acceptance, the speaker will become less and less vulnerable and more and more likely to open up the inner recesses of his or her mind to the listener. Again, assume that you have something to learn. Bill Nye, everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. I put it this way, everybody is an expert in something. Number three, Use open-ended questions. In this case, take a cue from journalists. Start your questions with who, what, where, when, why, or how. If you put in a complicated question, you're going to get a simple answer out. If I ask you, were you terrified? You're going to respond to the most powerful word in that sentence, which is terrified. And the answer is, yes, I was, or no, I wasn't. Were you angry? Yes, I was very angry. Let them describe it. They're the ones that know. Try asking them things like, what was that like? How did that feel? because then they might have to stop for a moment and think about it, and you're going to get a much more interesting response. Number four, go with the flow. That means thoughts will come into your mind, and you need to let them go out of your mind. 
We've heard interviews often in which a guest is talking for several minutes and then the host comes back in and asks a question which seems like it comes out of nowhere or it's already been answered. That means the host probably stopped listening two minutes ago because he thought of this really clever question and he was just bound and determined to say that. And we do the exact same thing. We're sitting there having a conversation with someone and then we remember that time that we met Hugh Jackman in a coffee shop. <laughs> and we stop listening. Stories and ideas are gonna to come to you. You need to let them come and let them go. Number five, if you don't know, say that you don't know. Now, people on the radio, especially on NPR, are much more aware that they're going on the record. And so they're more careful about what they claim to be an expert in and what they claim to know for sure. Do that, err on the side of caution. Talk should not be cheap. Number six, don't equate your experience with theirs. If they're talking about having lost a family member, don't start talking about the time that you lost a family member. If they're talking about the trouble that they're having at work, don't tell them about how much you hate your job. It's not the same. It is never the same. All experiences are individual. And more importantly, it is not about you. You don't need to take that moment to prove how amazing you are or how much you've suffered. Somebody asked Stephen Hawking once what his IQ was, and he says, I have no idea. People who brag about their IQs are losers. <laughs> Conversations are not a promotional opportunity. <laughs> Number seven, <laughs> try not to repeat yourself. It's condescending, and it's really boring, and we tend to do it a lot, especially in work conversations or in conversations with our kids. We have a point to make, so we just keep rephrasing it over and over. Don't do that. Number eight, stay out of the weeds. Frankly, people don't care about the years, the names, the dates, all those details that you're struggling to come up with in your mind. They don't care. What they care about is you. They care about what you're like, what you have in common. So forget the details, leave them out. Number nine, this is not the last one, but it is the most important one, listen. I cannot tell you how many really important people have said that listening is perhaps the most, the number one most important skill that you could develop. Buddha said, and I'm paraphrasing, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. And Calvin Coolidge said, no man ever listened his way out of a job. <laughs> Why do we not listen to each other? Number one, we'd rather talk. When I'm talking, I'm in control. I don't have to hear anything I'm not interested in. I'm the center of attention. I can bolster my own identity. But there's another reason. We get distracted. The average person talks at about 225 words per minute, but we can listen at up to 500 words per minute. So our minds are filling in those other 275 words. And look, I know it takes effort and energy to actually pay attention to someone. But if you can't do that, you're not in a conversation. You're just two people shouting out barely related sentences in the same place. <laughs> You have, to, you have to listen to one another. Stephen Covey said it very beautifully. He said, most of us don't listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply. One more rule, and number 10, and it's this one. Be brief. This boils down to the same basic concept, and it is this one. Be interested in other people. You know, I grew up with a very famous grandfather, and there was kind of a ritual in my home. People would come over to talk to my grandparents, and after they would leave, my mother would come over to us, and she'd say, do you know who that was? She was the runner-up to Miss America. He was the mayor of Sacramento. She won a Pulitzer Prize. He's a Russian ballet dancer. And I started, I kind of grew up assuming Everyone has some hidden amazing thing about them. And I, honestly, I think it's what makes me a better host. I keep my mouth shut as often as I possibly can. I keep my mind open, and I'm always prepared to be amazed. And I'm never disappointed. You do the same thing. Go out, talk to people, listen to people, and most importantly, be prepared to be amazed. Thanks. I thought that was amazing and a good way to kind of like just cap that 
And um, what Ashley shared with me yesterday, and he's a sports coach, he was saying he gets his staff to kind of like begin to focus on each of those and ask, what am I doing to kind of like build them? So uh, that's the summary that uh, she actually gives us and whatever. And I love that particular final comment, always be prepared to be amazed. And uh, that's why I love doing those type of activities in community and so on, in terms of it. Um, I just want to quickly now go back um, to, I just wanted to focus, because we don't have a lot of time, on what I think is the number one um, role that we have in terms of community building, and it's called hosting meaningful conversations. I think if I had to say, what's the key thing that we need to do, it is that. There's a couple of others I just want to quickly tap on without actually going into them, and these are particularly to do um, with this, and that is, I think, asset mapping and connecting is really important. I mentioned yesterday you can do something as simple as that. There's something we have online and that we use in our community. This is one we often use in festivals. and We just ask people on post-it notes. Put on yellow uh, if you've got a gift of the head you're willing to share with your community. Blue is hands and heart. And it's absolutely amazing what people will actually just leave behind. And you've instantly got this amazing kind of like asset treasure trove of what people are. And I think part of our role is to kind of like constantly build in that treasure trove. Um, one of the great tools, and that's why on your, on your uh, table you've got this uh, sheet, if you just quickly have a look at it, probably the most useful uh, bit of paper I give away to people. How many people are trained in IAP2? We've got a few. Um, again, it's something well worth thinking about, would you agree, in terms of being trained? really helps us to understand engagement. And fundamentally what it says is there are five levels, not five steps, but five levels of how we could engage with people. The most basic level is inform, and there's an appropriateness for that. That's where we basically need to just give out information. The goal is to provide balanced and subjective information in a timely manner, and the promise is we'll keep you informed. That's the most basic level. Then we have what's called consult. That's where, look, we're thinking of doing A or B, we want to get your opinion, this is A and this is B, what do you think? That's called feedback. And that's a form of consultation, it's a form of engagement, but it is also only the second level. Then we move into evolve, we move into collaborate, and we move into empower. And what that sheet really does is to show that every one of those is appropriate in the circumstances. What we do know, though, is the further we can move towards the right, the more powerful will be kind of like the experience. And so obviously what we are trying to do is to be particularly to kind of like move um, towards the right and the empowerment level. And there's a whole pile of techniques that you can actually use to do that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there is this particular handbook that we've put together you can download straight off our website. And it actually uses IAP2 and gives you these 30 odd different um, strategies, each of them are appropriate for a different level in terms of, of where you're actually at. Um, it gives you what the strengths of it, what the limitations of it, and some operational tips on how to make sure it works pretty powerfully for you. So I'll just share that with you. But that one bit of paper is really useful. If you don't get anything else out of today, take that away and just think about, and particularly think about how you can move the impact further towards the right which is really about looking at those goals and promises in terms of what that's actually all about. Too many of us are stuck at level one and two. And if you want genuine engagement of community, particularly in terms of this asset-based, community-driven model that we've been talking about today, we've definitely got to kind of like move down kind of like the equation further down the roll. And certainly, as I said, within it, there's a whole pile of tools you can use. And all of those tools at the bottom which is appropriate at different levels, are all summarised in that little handbook for you in terms of where it's actually at. Um, now, in terms of... Uh, um, just move on here. In terms of a couple of the tools in terms of meaningful conversation, one of the most important things I've learnt is that. A lot of our consultations, we have people in a the room, they sit like they're in church, person out the front with the butcher's paper and the dots, and we call that a conversation. It ain't a conversation. The best conversations happen when we're round in a circle. And you know the best number for that? Five. 
Four or five is the best number to have in a conversation. Six is okay, and seven is definitely one too many. When you're up around 10 around a table, look at the dynamics. Most people are thinking about what they're going to intervene with and listening to what's going on at the table. Try to get it down to that manageable level, and the more we can sit around a table, the better. Now, can I ask you this question? Unfortunately, I don't have chocolates, but what did those two revolutions have in common? The end of the 18th century, the uh, French Revolution, and what we've seen happening in the Middle East in what was called the Spring Revolutions that happened six or seven years ago in places like Bahrain and Cairo and uh, whatever. What do they have in common, those revolutions? Sorry? Time. What was it? Time. 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 Yep. Yep. What else? Where do they start? Sorry? Yep, they start in the community, but where in the community? They start with conversations, but where were the conversations? Yep, but where do they get that frustration? Where do they start expressing it? Sorry? Definitely, they both started in coffee shops. When we want to have a meaningful conversation with a friend, what's the usual immortal words we use? Can we catch up and have a coffee? What's the fastest growing retail outlet in most neighbourhoods? They're called coffee shops. They're replacing community centres. There's something about being in it. And so there was a Norwegian couple who invented a tool called Will Cafe, or what some of us prefer to call cafe conversation, who said, if the coffee shop's the ultimate place to kind of have meaningful conversations, why not simulate that? Why hold boring meetings when you can actually have a coffee shop and do it there? And certainly I've found over and over, simulating the coffee shop. Today I'll never run a public meeting. I'll say to people, let's facilitate a cafe conversation and we'll have coffee smells and muffins and decorations. I love having a honky-tonk piano player playing in the corner when people arrive. Tell you what, it's a totally different environment. And what I love is you get people around tables, no more than five. Best place to run one is obviously in a coffee shop. Already there. This is one that happens every week in one of the little New South Wales towns. But again, how do we actually create and simulate and get people together? This leads to far better outcomes in terms of people's engagement than everyone sitting like they're sitting in church in rows with someone out the front with a butcher's paper type stuff. And the thing about the coffee shop is you have this incredible thing called the table. And you get people around and you use the tablecloth to start recording the comments and whatever. And that then becomes the powerful collector of all of those ideas and whatever. It's an amazing technique. How many people use World Cafe? Got a couple in the room. Have a go. Next time you're going to run a public meeting, I've run one with over 500 people having a dinner at the same time. It is magical. And the best thing about it is there's a little technique in it called shuffle the pack. So you actually start with just the question you want the group to answer, but you come at it from different angles. So, for example, um, these are the ground rules that we kind of like use, but last week I was working with the fire service, uh, the new fire service in uh, New Zealand, and the critical question that they wanted to answer as a group is how can we empower, support and partner with communities to build their resilience? That's the question. But we simply came at it and we had four mini conversations. And the first, always start with the appreciative. What is it currently we do as a fire service that really does actually empower communities? What is it we've got to keep doing? What is it that works that would be lovely to have more of it? And so that was the first conversation. And people are around the tables and they're doodling and writing their thoughts and conversing and then we'd have a bit of a, an idea download and put all those ideas up. And then we use a technique called shuffle the pack, and it's what people love. And that is where you say, well, look, apparently there's a correlation between baldness and brilliance. The less hair people have, don't you agree, the, the smarter they are. You, you would know that, you know, that's why I'm so dumb, you can, and whatever. And, okay, so if that's true, let's make that the person, the host of the table. Pick the person with the least hair in the group. Everyone else, hop up and move to a new table. The person who's the baldy in the group, you're the new host of the table. You welcome everyone, get people to introduce themselves and whatever. 
And then we moved on to the second one, which was the same topic, but what is it we actually need to kind of like change? What is it if we modify, we get better impact? Identify the person who's been in the fire service the longest. Obviously, that's kind of like a bit of wisdom. Everyone else, hop up and move to a new table. The third one was about what is it we've got to stop doing? What is it that we've got to start doing? So the same question, but different points of view. You know, that conversation only lasted an hour and five minutes. But in that time, people had in-depth conversation with 16 different people. Much more refreshing than everyone sitting in a meeting with one person kind of like talking and everyone else just listening, thinking about what they would say if they get a chance to say it. Much more powerful kind of like technique. If you've never used it, think about using it. And then you can always use good old dot democracy of ways of pulling it actually together. How many people use open space? Got one. What is it, Denver? Put you on the mat. Yep. One of the greatest things I've ever discovered, and the person who introduced it was this guy called Harrison Owen. He got a PhD for this. And his PhD was, what is it when people come to workshops and conferences, what's the best part of the day? And guess what he discovered? What's the best part of any conference? Yeah. Hey? Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not that brutal. You know, that came up about number four, I think, yeah? Lunch was number one. What do you reckon was number two? Morning tea. What do you think was number three? Afternoon tea. What was number four? Drinks afterwards. <laughs> and then leaving. And he thought, you know, if that's true, why? Because you couldn't get a PhD for just identifying that. Why were they the best times? What happens during those times? But who do you get to talk to? You? Maybe. Maybe an old person. People you want to talk to. You decide who you talk to. The rest of the time, it's people who are organising you, telling you what to do. And what do you talk about? What you want to talk about. And that's what he got his PhD for. He said, if that's true, well, why shouldn't we then organise sessions around that? Why don't we actually then decide and get people to suggest the agenda? And he called them the wicked questions. What's the topic, the opportunity, the challenge, the issue? What is it that I really want to get out of this particular workshop or this meeting? And I wonder who else in the audience might care about that or be as excited as me? And wouldn't it be good to have some quality time with them? And so fundamentally, this is where you invite people to kind of like really host the conversations around what they want to kind of like talk about. And what's interesting is, you invite people to come up with the themes that they would love to have other people. And so they create what's called the wall, the agenda. And then people in it then decide which one they want to kind of like go to. And so you might have three people here, you might have seven people there, you might have 20 people in another. You might even have one person who's really serious about a topic and they're the only person who turns up at the table. I always say, well, look, have a conversation with yourself. It's fantastic. When was the last time you had time to really think through that particular topic? And so people then gather around their themes. And the outcome is that everyone's got to come up with their two to three nuggets of gold and report that back to the meeting. It's an incredible technique in community to use when you're particularly trying to get people to come up with new ways and new ideas and whatever. Again, if you haven't tried it, give it a go. Go onto the website. There's a good one pager that just tells you how to do it. Now, what I love about open space is part of his PhD came up with four principles. Whoever comes are the right people. Whenever it starts is the right time. Whatever happens, the only thing that could have. And when it's over, it's over. How simple. It's a lovely technique. And then there's one other great what's called the law of two feet. There is a law attached to this motion. And what's that mean? If during the course of the gathering, any person finds themselves in a situation where they're neither learning nor contributing, they're going to use their two feet and go to a more productive space. So if you suddenly choose to go to a table and you find it's the most boring group on the face of the earth and it's not what you thought it was, why well, don't stay there, take responsibility, go somewhere else. Go to another group. 
it's an amazing technique. And again, whenever I've used this in community, boy, it's fantastic. I had to convene a, a 300 young persons event in uh, the Middle East in Qatar about three or four years ago. The Qataris have heaps of money, so we could have the best speakers in the world. 150 of them were Arab young people, 150 of them were non-Arab young people. We had the Secretary General of the UN. We had the, you know, uh, what's his name, who created Virgin. Had some amazing speakers. But one half day was committed to open space where they could come up with the topics and themes they wanted. And overwhelmingly, all the valuation said, by far the best thing of the three-day gathering was open space, where they determined the agenda and they met with other people who cared about what they wanted to care about. And they found it. And I found that over and over. It's an amazing technique to build in. If you haven't tried it, really have a go. It's amazing. How many people use keypad technology? It's a great way to get people into making decisions where everyone has this thing like a remote and you put up the questions. Press 1 if you strongly agree. Press 2 if you only agree. Press 3 if you're neutral. Press 4 if you disagree. Press 5 if you strongly disagree. Press 6 if you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. And instantly, you know exactly how the whole room are thinking. Wow! 90% of you in the room think this is a brilliant idea that we're wanting to do, but 10% of you think it's a lousy idea. The people want to share why. It's a great way to get a great conversation going in terms of it, and particularly with that age group. Fantastic. And then again, we've got to realise we do live in this particular world. And in terms of engaging people, particularly this group, some of the techniques, and I don't know, how many people use Town Hall Social as a way of stimulating conversation in their community? Again, Google it. It's a fantastic technique. Have a look at the groups using it. The Green Political Party, the Brisbane City Council, biggest local government in Australia, the Bulldogs football team in New South Wales. Great way where they drop questions into the community through Facebook sites and whatever to get reaction. Amazing, again, communication technique. And finally, some ideas for mobilising people. And again, if you go on to our website, some very useful stuff there about 20, kind of like uh, eight ways to get more people recruited. It's just a whole pile of brilliant ideas people have come up with. There was another one called 83 Ways to Recognise, Reward and Retain, because at the end of the day, retaining people is the most important. Now, finally, one of the things that I think we need to do in community building is to harvest and kind of like share stories. Let's stop putting out sp spreadsheets and kind of like fact sheets and all of that theory stuff, you want to enthuse people, kind of like share stories. Now, I really believe those kind of like uh, two quotes, that the most powerful way to put ideas in. Now, I mainly work in the revitalization of dying small towns. That's my area of specialty. And so I've often got to go in and how do you stimulate a town that's just full of empty shops and its main street? Population is probably 25% of what it was, you know, 25 years ago. How do you get people in that main street thinking and excited? How do you get traders beginning to think about new ways to get the tills ringing? Well, I could go in and I can give a lecture about customer service. I can talk about innovative marketing. I can talk about staff motivation, all the things we know that actually get businesses going. I can give them a theory lecture. Or I can turn up and I can tell them kind of like a story like I did this morning. And in this case, I tell them a story about my mate from a little town in Queensland. He's a fourth generation Greek fruitier. Coles have just opened a new world down the road in Caloundra. It's only 20 minutes away. They're offering 10 times his range at two thirds of his price. How's he gonna cope? Well, according to him, there's only one way to cope and that's to build on your passion. You can see what his passion is, it's called the king. He reckons the best $24 he ever spent was changing his name by deed poll to Elvis Parsley. <laughs> he repainted his shop and calls it Grapelands. And as you come wandering into the place, he comes out dressed like that, singing not Viva Viva La Vegas, but Viva Viva La Veggies. He's reworded all the songs of the king. You know, this is what modern tourism is all about. That is what everyone wants to be able to flick onto their Facebook and uh, Instagram and whatever. Now this guy in this little town of Woodford 
now employs 10 full-time staff called the Swing Zucchinis. On average, he has 10 tourist buses a day pull up at his kind of like shop. When he started, the Chamber of Commerce guy called him a Fruit Loop. You know, that same chamber now saying you don't open on a Sunday will pay you to open on Sunday because you're the honey pop business in town. This guy has totally reinvented his little village. Now, I can give a theory or I can tell him the story of Elvis Parsley. And the question then is, what is special? What is it about you that stands out? What is it you've got to do in terms of innovative marketing and whatever? And so I suppose the same applies in terms of whether you're wanting to promote your sport or your particular target group or whatever. What's in your story collection? You all know the statistics and facts and figures and theory of what you're doing, but how many of you have got stories? Stories are incredibly powerful. One story. I can talk about how important it is that everyone has a gift, or I can tell them the story of the soup kitchen. After hearing the story, or legless Les, people understand it far better than me giving them the theory about people having gifts and needing to asset map all that stuff. Stories are incredibly powerful as a tool. And so can I challenge all of you, whatever field you're in, start building up your story collection. There might be a story that you've personally been involved in, one you might have heard, one you might have read about, but you've got to have stories. Stories are incredibly powerful. And finally, can I say, if you're really interested in this new approach, um, there are a couple of really useful resources. I poo-hooed uh, um, um, Jody Kretzman's book, but this is the one I really love. One of their disciples, a guy called Mike Green, I've quoted from him a lot today. And it's called a book, When People Care Enough to Act. It's put out by Inclusion Press in Canada, a sister organisation to many of you and what you're doing. And what I love about it, it's dedicated to those two young women on the front cover. They happen to be the daughters of the two main writers. Both of them have labels attached. One because of the colour of a skin, the other because of a supposed disability. And what these two fathers wanted to do was to write a book challenging communities to never look at their daughters as anything but fully gifted. And I love the introduction. We want so much that our daughters know a community life that's truly good. My dream has always been that Anne will get the chance to live a life where she is needed for her gifts. And so these two fathers write a book on how do we recognise everyone in community as an incredible asset and how do we mobilise communities around what people can offer and particularly what they care about. It's the best book I have ever read and I really encourage you to kind of like uh, go on and uh, track it down, just go on to the, uh, Google. It's about $40 but it'll be the best investment you'll ever make if you're truly serious about community building when people care enough to act. It's an amazing practical book and I just love the commitment to their two daughters in trying to say when we're not around as two fathers, we truly want to leave a legacy behind that really values our two daughters for what they can share and give. There are two other books. This guy, Paul Bourne, got the biggest grant in philanthropic history, 10 million Canadian dollars, but he had a challenge, how to move 100,000 families out of poverty in 10 cities over 10 years. And he believes the only way you do that is through mobilising community. And he's written an amazing book called Community Conversations. He gives you 10 case studies and 10 tools you can use. And then the book I used yesterday in facilitation, the one by Ernesto Soroli, Ripples from Zambezi. If you're keen on facilitation, that's by far the best book I've got. And finally, if you go onto our website, there are literally thousands and thousands of kind of like ideas there that people have shared with us and we've just put them up and you can download all of them. So finally, any final questions or contributions before we close? Anyone got any final? Yep. So, so, start the, the, the so, um, so, if you're starting a conversation with a community, yep. um, and, but you've got lots of varied interests and conflicts of interest, how do you, what, how do you get them on the same page to, to come up with a, with a, a um, you know, similar goal? 
Yeah, look, um, one thing is that we need to realise that community building moves at the speed of trust and, you know, often if you're just coming in, maybe you need to spend time just identifying all of that. I can remember once I was working in Indonesia and putting together a whole pile of youth uh, enterprise projects across Bali and Lombok. And the guy I was working with, the Indonesian, said to me, Peter, you're in too much of a hurry, mate. You need to slow down. Um, you need to eat a bag of salt with people before you'll see any progress. I didn't know what he was talking about. What do you mean I've got to eat a bag of salt? What do you think he meant by that expression? Sorry? Got? Yeah, but a bit more. The simple interpretation is you don't eat a bag of salt in one meal. You eat it over many meals. And he was saying, take time. Get to know who the, the uh, people are and start to do that. But then you may find after time there are opposing people. It's about how do you bring them together. I tend to find often getting them a bit of fun and getting them starting to listen to each other can be useful. Um, but I had... The other week in a little town called Granity on the west coast of New Zealand, a girl raised the same question. She said, look, we just don't have a coffee place in our town. There's nowhere to socially meet. But one woman dominates the whole town and I've tried to raise with her doing something. She's just poo-hooed me. What can I do? I said, well, I thought of backing over in the car park late one night. That's one answer. She looked at me and said, Peter, I'm the wife of the policeman. I don't think I can do that one, you know. And I said, well, think about it. You know, are there other people who really care about what you're wanting to do? Maybe start with conversation. So that night she went home and she typed up onto the Facebook of the town. Hi, I'm Megan. My, my husband's the local copper. You know that. I just love coffee and I love cake and I love good conversations. I wonder if there's anyone else in the village who also loves cake, coffee and good conversations. I'm thinking of trying to get a group together, just have a conversation about whether we could get a coffee kind of like area, maybe just even once a week together. So I'm just proposing, if anyone else cares about that, when you come around the cop station, I know some of you have really been interested in trying to discover what that looks like. And on Friday afternoon at three o'clock, I'm just going to put on some coffee and cake and let's have a conversation. You know what? In a little village of 200 people, 19 people respond back within 12 hours. The Friday meeting, there were 31 people turned up and they just started looking. So out went the thing, we need crockery, we need cups. They suddenly discovered their little hall in the town and it cost $20 a day to rent it. Boy, we can add 50 cents on or we'll just have a, a gold coin, kind of like donation. People donated tablecloths. Someone is kind of like into uh, music, said, listen, I'd love to just come and play and strum in the background. And you know what? Over the last six weeks, they've got the most amazing Friday coffee thing. And somewhere between 60 and 80 people in a village of 200 are now turning up. Now, here's a young woman who was just terrified of how you kind of like start. Because one person just kind of like dominates and whatever. So maybe it's just about how you get people together. But I've learned, do it in a fun, do it in a lighthearted, just, you know, do it in a way that no one can actually but kind of like giggle at it and so on. Any other final questions? So the question I pose to you, what are you going to do different tomorrow? You've just sat through a three-hour workshop. Is there anything out of today that you think, you know, what's the one thing I think I could actually do? I genuinely want to get into this thing called community building. Seems to me that's the critical thing that we've got to identify. Don't need to do everything we've tried to talk about here, but what's the one thing that I plan to kind of like do tomorrow in terms of how we might move forward. So finally, if I had to summarise in three things, the most important thing for me is one, find out what people care about that they're willing to act upon. Empower them to do it and don't stifle it with bureaucracy. They are really at the heart of what it's all about. And so it's time for lunch. And finally, can I leave you with a lovely Māori prayer that the Kiwis always say, and I love it, with your food basket and my food basket, the people will thrive. So talking about food, it's time for lunch. Thanks, John. Thank you.